Hi, everybody. It's lovely to see you. You can hear me okay, yes? Um, it's, a, it, it's, it's a real thrill to be here tonight. Um, the, the genesis of this book uh, goes back about two years. Um, I had been asked to contribute a foreword to this very beautiful coffee table book that Lonely Planet published. And um, as a result of uh, becoming very friendly with the editor that I was working on that book with, a wonderful fellow down in Melbourne, at the, uh, in the Melbourne office on, of Lonely Planet, he asked me if I was interested in um, working on this anthology. And it, it really honestly took me about two minutes actually make that two seconds to make the decision because I've been such a almost really literally lifelong fan of Lonely Planet um, you know from the first time I strapped a backpack to my back at basically age 16 Lonely Planet has always been somewhere in my my orbit and so it was it was, a, it was just it was an easy answer and it was a great thrill and um, coming up with the sort of basic conceit, the c construct, if you will, of the book was, was also a thrill and a real pleasure. Um, the basic construct of the book is honestly not so very different than, than that of Saver, and that's really sort of explaining, telling who we are as people through this very specific lens, through what we eat through what happens at our tables, what happens in our kitchens, in our markets. Um, you know, I, I became a kind of food nut sort of by accident very early in my life. When I was a kid, I wasn't particularly close with my dad, who was a traveling salesman. He sold office products, but he would come back from his travels and he would cook and um, he would make these extraordinary meals um, basically replicating these great dishes that he'd eaten in you know whatever restaurant of the moment there was in Portland Oregon or Seattle or Indianapolis or fill in the blanks American City and through that I fell in love with food and I, I guess I fell in love with this idea of understanding the world and my place in it through food. And so, all that said, that's kind of what this book is about. It's basically about who we are through these kind of momentous um, memories that, that, we, that we share in food. We all have them, each one of us in this room, each one of us on this planet has like probably at least a hundred meals that we could spout off very, very easily, effortlessly, of meals that in some way affected us, impacted us um, in a small way or sometimes in a big way. Um, and that is what I set about when I asked the wonderful contributors to this book to to provide for the book stories, moments from their lives that, um, as I say, in some small way or big way, um, that's such a grand sound. Josh Ozersky, that is an amazing ringtone. What is that about? Star, what is that? Oh my god, I totally remember that. I'm having like a sense memory of that. Does anybody else rec recognize that sound? Yeah. Star Hustler. <laughs> Thank you for that, Josh Ozersky. Um, that, god, that's so amazing. That just like totally stole the show. Um, um, you know, without further ado, I think we should we should let these amazing folks, um, you know, uh, tell their tell their stories. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six fantastic contributors to the to the book, uh, who will be reading excerpted passion, um, um, portions of of the pieces that they contributed to the book. So first up, we have a very very dear personal friend of mine, um, Brett, Beth Cracklauer. Beth is the food editor of the off duty section at the Wall Street Journal, and before. Before that, she was an editor at Gourmet Magazine, and um, most recently she was deputy editor at Sever Magazine for, for many, many happy years. So, um, Beth, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Excellent. 
Um, just to give you a little bit of context, because I'm only reading a small section of this, this is about um, a barbecue that my family does in Kentucky, um, in rural Kentucky, where my father's relatives live every summer, um, the centerpiece of which is this like incredible custom-built smoker that my cousins made out of a garbage dumpster that just <clears throat> produces like the most delicious pig you've ever had in your life. So this is the story of the pilgrimage that my family would take from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, down to Kentucky every year and kind of why we did it. My father made his first trip to Kentucky at the age of two and a half. Up to then, the only world he knew was the t Teutonic Midwest, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where his southern Irish Catholic mother had settled among her husband's German immigrant family. It was the spring of 1936, and my grandmother, shattered by the death of an infant son she'd only just delivered, had to be hospitalized. For whatever reason, no relatives were able to take in little Fred and his five-year-old sister, Joanne. Now, Joanne was a well-behaved girl whom various neighbors were only too happy to watch over for a while. But Fred had already developed a reputation, wisecracking, argumentative, etc. And so my grandmother's sister Elsie, then a footloose young student nurse, boarded a train in Louisville, Kentucky, along with her friend Belle, and headed north to collect her nephew. The two young ladies made a big impression, and vice versa. I can remember Ann Elsie in later years shaking with laughter as she told the one about how young Fred pulled himself up on his seat and entertained the whole train carriage with a saucy song his father had taught him, two old maids in a folding bed. At last, an appreciative audience. Fred stayed through the summer with another of his mother's sisters, May, and her, sister and her husband, Ed, on their farm near the edge of Fort Knox. Once his mother had recovered and he'd returned to Wisconsin, he often headed back to that farm again come summer. Aunt May was known for having little patience for children. She had none of her own. Well, she must have been saving up all of her patience for him, because, as my dad remembers it, he was lavished with attention and affection. As a little boy, he'd ride on Uncle Ed's lap for hours as he drove the hay rake. Later, when Fred was eight or nine years old and interested in smoking cigarettes, like his cousins were, Aunt May packed a corncob pipe with dry leaves, and the two of them sat and smoked together. Oh, Aunt May made such nice food, Dad always says. Pole beans are what he usually mentions first. They were cooked in their pods and finished with hunks of bacon that Aunt May cured herself, along with country ham my dad claims was less salty and more delectably porky than any other he's tried. Fried chicken, roast chicken too, with a dressing full of homemade sausage. Big fluffy biscuits smothered in white chicken gravy, or just a smear of Aunt May's sweet butter. Uncle Ed liked to pour caro syrup over his plate, though Aunt May denounced it as low class. You don't do that to good food. What good food is was precisely what young Fred was learning at Aunt May's table. That, and a sense of how when something's made with care, you appreciate it with equal care. How food can be a way for people who aren't otherwise especially demonstrative to express themselves. By the time I was born, Grandpa Cracklauer had long since died, and Grandma was back in Louisville. Each summer, like a salmon finding its way upstream to its spawning place, my father packed us in the station wagon for the trip to Kentucky. We'd go out and visit Aunt May and Uncle Ed and their three-legged dog, Tippy. That is, until Tippy met his end, heroically, seizing and killing a rabid fox that charged Aunt May while she was hanging laundry in the yard. This story loomed large in our family mythology. Back in Pittsburgh, our schnauzer was never called upon to rise to such an occasion. There was a grape barber outside the kitchen door and a blackberry bramble along the fence. I remember Aunt May putting on her bonnet, gently leading me by the hand out to the bramble and showing me how to pluck the squishy dark fruit from the prickly branches. She baked her berries into juicy cobblers and her cherries and peaches into pies with lattice tops. Like our father before us, my brother, sister, and I happily ate it all up. The culmination of every, tr every trip was a meal at the Doe Run Inn in nearby Brandenburg. The restaurant was in an old stone mill built in the early 19th century by Squire Boone, brother of Daniel. It was a wide, it had a wide breezy screened porch overlooking a small waterfall that kicked up a mist, making this possibly the coolest place in all of Kentucky on a hot afternoon. We'd sit at a long table on that porch with a rotating cast of aunts and uncles and cousins and eat food jam-packed with a taste I guess I'd now call umami, but back then could only experience, not articulate. Ruddy, intensely salty shards of cured, aged country ham, for example. The savory flavor was so concentrated and so addictive, I had to gulp down lemonade in order to keep eating it. Fried chicken livers with a breading as ethereal as tempura and a velvety interior that tasted like iron and earth. As a small kid, I preferred the fried chicken, crunchy and peppery outside, moist and silky within. 
Even the creamy salad dressing dolloped on wedges of sweet iceberg lettuce was powerfully flavorful, clotted with curds of pungent blue cheese. And then, for dessert, a slice of tart, gooey lemon chest pie. As everyone ate, they talked about what they were eating, what the cooks must have done to make it so good, how it compared to the way Aunt May did it, or Aunt Anna, or the cooks who were in the Doe Run kitchen 20 years ago. The gravity they brought to this ritual held them together. This was what an intact family looked like. Don't you like the chicken livers? Someone would inevitably ask me. So I kept on eating them until I did. 10 or 15 summers ago, my family paid a visit to the Doe Run Inn and learned that it had changed hands. The menu now featured such dishes as salmon grilled on a cedar plank and chicken Caesar salad. We were horrified. It wasn't long before cousin Jeannie took matters into her own hands. Jeannie works for the local telephone company and had often held work events at the Doe Run Inn. She tracked down the previous owners and got them to hand over their recipes. And she marched over to the restaurant and said, here, this is how it's done. Jeannie's not the sort of lady you say no to. And so the old favorites were restored, the chicken livers, the biscuits, the chess pie, but it was never quite the same. The topography around there isn't as we remember it either. The landmarks have changed. Along the road leading up to Aunt May and Uncle Ed's, what was once farmland is now overlaid with a grid of semi-suburban development. Dad has a hard time finding his way. Last summer, we arrived to find a sign tacked at the front of the Doe Run Inn, closed until further notice. When we asked what had happened, Cousin Pat shook his head. You know, the last time I was there, the fried chicken was greasy. Greasy chicken at the Doe Run Inn. I knew I could never go back. Still, the annual barbecue carries on, migrating along with the hulking smoker hiked up on rubber tires between the cousins' houses. Dad takes his place among the dwindling group of his contemporaries. We make our way down the long tables of food. We pile our plates with juicy pulled pork. We defy the humidity with cold beers and hand churred ice cream made with fresh picked peaches. This, at least, is exactly as we remember it. Thanks. That was very, that was very lovely, Beth. Well, tell us about chess pie, for those of us who don't know. Oh, can take. Well, this is a lemon chess pie. A, chess, a regular chess pie is a sort of a plain and quite sugary thing, but it's, it's the lemon added, it gets quite gooey and tart. And after a really salty meal, it's just exactly the Oh, how nice. And I salute the inner tippy inside of all of us. <laughs> um, next up, um, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, author that, that uh, I hope that you're all familiar with, Monique Truong. Um, Monique is the author of two truly fabulous novels, uh, Bitter in the Mouth and The Book of Salt, both of which won the Barbara Giddings Book Award in Literature and the Penn Robert Bingham Award. Monique? Thanks. You haven't even heard me yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read um, just a couple of pages from the very beginning of an essay called Enchanted Isle. The emotional equivalence of jet lag is the inn of a love affair, and yet you, foolish and besotted lover, won't let go. You're still keeping time by his sun and moon, waking when he wakes and sleeping only when he closes his eyes. Travel when it was slow. Used to provide a halfway house of sorts, a neither here nor there for the recently expelled and brokenhearted. On the ship or the long locomotive journey back home, the traveler had time to consider the landscape where she had been and to comprehend how her body, with every minute and hour, was now deliberately moving farther and farther away. By the time that she has reached home, the traveler has had days or weeks to understand the absence of that other body of land, to hold her heart steady and her head high again. Air travel changed everything. 
We now allow ourselves to be propelled there and back with such great speed that when we return, our bodies protest, rebel, seeking something concrete or intangible that we can no longer offer. No wonder our bodies punish us with unrequited sleeplessness and crushing fatigue. My worst and most prolonged bouts of jet lag haven't always correlated with the distances traveled or the differences in time. Often, the intensity of my stupor has everything to do with how hard I have fallen. Like love for a man or a woman, love for a destination on a map cannot be planned. Sometimes, the affection is hard earned, even a result of a feat of courage or a trial by ordeal. Once in a while, if fate and luck travels with me. There is a singular, indelible moment that feels like a first kiss. On Lefkada, one of the Ionian islands off the western coast of Greece, the kiss took place on an open patio with a sweeping view of the foothills of Mount Stravrota interrupted only by the occasional column of swaying cypress trees. The scent of Lefkada in the late spring was courtesy of the Genestra flowers, which bloomed bright yellow and covered the island in patches like sunlight. They released a delicious fragrance, crushed fresh herbs, mint, thyme, fennel fronds, sage, and oregano, with a dollop of clover honey on top, and laced with the improbable, mouth-watering scent of a butter cake that's almost ready to be taken out of the oven. I had traveled to Lafcada to research the Greek-Irish writer Lafcadio Hearn, the subject of my novel in progress. From 1850 till his passing in 1904, Hearn made his home on three continents. Lefkada, also the name of the island's main town, was Hearn's birthplace and namesake, and for me a necessary portal into this man's peripatetic life. You must believe me that the following sentence is fact and not mere puffery. From its inception, a novel is an act of courage. It does not always require the author to travel, but it's always a long journey into the pitch darkness for her. Only the brave, or perhaps the foolish, will dare it. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Next up, one of my favorite authors on planet Earth, Josh Star Hustler Ozersky. <laughs> um, Josh's books include The Hamburger, A History, Meet Me in Manhattan, that's M-E-A-T, me in Manhattan, A Carnivore's Guide to New York City, and Archie Bunker's America's TV, Amer Archie Bunker's America, TV in an Era of Change. He is also the founding editor of Grub Street, for which he received a James Beard Foundation Award, and is currently the editor-at-large at Esquire. Star Hustlers. <laughs> Have anybody ever saw that show? <laughs> um, this is a uh, an essay which um, I'm sort of just going to give you a deleted version of. It's about uh, my father. I wrote an essay in Savor. It's probably the best thing I ever wrote. Thank you again, Jim, for publishing it. It's about my father as a great gourmand, another also Meshuggan like myself. And uh, this uh, is about when I went with him to uh, Paris for the first time when I was 17 years old. 
My father's attachment to raw wheat bran was unnatural, yes, and in some ways even masochistic, but it made sense if you knew what his diet was like. Not that it helped any. He had strange ideals of austerity that had almost no connection with what was going on inside his body. An example, for my entire childhood, he insisted on making me drink sour grayish green grapefruit juice on the basis that it was less fattening than sweet delicious orange juice. I was to find out later that they were almost identical. It was merely the badness of the former that appealed to him. Bran was a similarly penitential agent. He consumed Chinese spare ribs, blackened steaks, salami sandwiches, sausage pizzas, and every kind of verst he could get his hands on, generally while standing in front of the refrigerator or over the sink. He also drank prodigiously. He was charismatic, loquacious, and unpredictable. So when I got the news that we were going to Paris, I wasn't at all sure what to expect. <coughs> My father's fascination with food was one of the few fixed points of my childhood. A gifted painter, he produced a long series of enormously expressive semi-abstract oil paintings about sh of chefs. I still have them and they make me feel very happy, which would have pleased him since he considered his daily life as more or less their waste products. A melancholy person, he was rarely cheered by anything, but food was one thing that could be counted upon to get him excited. He was never happier than when contemplating a takeout menu. For my part, an only child raised among depressives, these occasional flashes of light seemed like a much bigger deal than they were, but then food and movies were just about the only things we were able to speak freely about. This was especially true in my teenage years when we lived together in a state of deep gloom interspersed with bursts of glee in our Atlantic City apartment. I was 18 when I first heard about the trip. Was it possible he could stay happy for the whole time? It wasn't that far-fetched a possibility. My father had read Liebling as a young man and loved to quote from Between Meals, much of which he had, he thought, committed to memory. The book is a rhapsody of gluttony set in the Paris of the lost generation, although Liebling didn't know it at the time. Like my father, he was primarily concerned with eating, and like my father, so much so that he would spend hours pondering menus. It, I never read it myself, it being boring looking, but I loved it vicariously through my father who used to say, tonight we're gonna ring the gong, whenever he felt exceptionally excited about an imminent meal. The phrase derived, he said, from a story in Between Meals when a young Liebling went into a fancy restaurant and used the phrase, an idiom he had learned in a book somewhere. Nobody understood what he was saying, and he later found out that the expression was one that hadn't been common since the 17th century. My father fell in love with it in that random way of his, though, and the words, we're going to ring the gong, persist in my own foodie patter for reasons no one can understand. It's something of a private joke I have with myself. The prospect of going to Paris with my father was special for another reason. It would be the longest period I had spent with him since becoming self-aware somewhere around the age of 15. My father, a stagehand at Resorts International Hotel Casino, worked a four to midnight shift, so was almost never home when I got back from school. My exposure to him, his strange flights of humor, his movie quotes, his sad expressions, his hidden emotions and obscure past, all came pretty much a few hours at a time. He kept a small bottle of vodka in the egg compartment and refused to eat fudge. I didn't understand him, but I wanted to be like him. I was curious what he would be like in Paris. As it turned out, he was pretty much himself in Paris, only more so. While we did visit a few cultural touchstones, some of which even prompted a rare nugget of art history insight from him, mostly we were killing time between meals. I stood with him at the Rodin Museum contemplating the thinker. He looked at it for a long time. I hoped he might say something smart and deep, something I could parrot in the presence of my friends. Instead, I got a predictable joke, one that made me laugh anyway. Should I get the steak or the cassoulet? <laughs> he asked in what he imagined would be the statue's voice. Our hotel, the small but elegant Claude Bernard, with its phone booth elevator sheathed by a spiraling staircase, was the kind of place a man might shoot his cuffs and meet his mistress.
As a rube, I naturally was awed by it, but within 15 minutes, our clothes were lying around. My father had a small bottle of vodka on the bedside table, and there was a box of bran in the bathroom. It wasn't a bowl of bran or a container of bran. It was the actual box transported from our refrigerator with a spoon from room service thrust into it. The idea was that we would eat so much rich food that the brand would provide the needed roughage to keep our bowels in good working order. This was less than glamorous. It sat there for the whole trip. I felt that we were not a good fit in Paris. I told my father that there was a water fountain in the bathroom. Women use that to wash their twats, he explained to me. And so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, it's, it, it's, it goes on in this mordant way for a while. It's just two last paragraphs I'll give you and then move on. My dad's joke about steak versus cassoulet was more relevant than he knew. Cassoulet was a, film, was a familiar theme to me at the time and one of the many disappointments of the trip. From my dutiful reading of Liebling, I had arrived in France ready for a cassoulet epiphany. I had even read in my father's, I had even read in my father's dank copy of Waverly Roots, The Food of France, that, were not, that there were not one but three casseroles that defined the three regions of France, one from some place that used only pork, another from a place called Carcassonne or something that also added mutton and sounded great, and finally, the celebrated Toulouse version which had all that stuff, plus sausages and duck that had been simmered in its own fat. That sounded awesome, which made it all the more depressing when the reality turned out to be a dollop of tasteless white beans adorned with a few pieces here and there of sausage and salt pork. Cassoulet, at least in the form I got it, turned out to be an essentially unsauced version of franks and beans. This discovery was part of a larger, more depressing reality that had nothing to do with my father. My problem in Paris was that, while I had thoroughly and eagerly internalized all of his food propaganda about the place, I didn't actually like anything there. It wasn't simply, as with the grapefruit juice, his, prefer his perverse preference for everything that was bad. It was simply that I had no point of reference for salads with raw eggs in them, or bony quails that required careful dissection to eat, or monstrous sausage-sized oysters like the one I was forced to consume at Vivrois. Everywhere I went, I got steak frites or something like it. I knew I disappointed my father, but there was nothing I could do about it. My upbringing had prioritized grilled cheese and bacon sandwiches, portly cheese steaks, slabs of cake, and best of all, crusty, greasy hash browns cooked impatiently at the bottom of a pot. Somehow we had lost all the pans. I'll stop there. That's very fun. Thank you, Josh. Um, next we have Sigrid Nunez. Uh, Sigrid has published six novels, including A Feather on the Breath of God, The Last of Her Kind, and most recently, Salvation City. She's also the author of Se Sempre Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag. Uh, her many honors include a Whiting Writers Award and two awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She is also a fellow at the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Sigrid. Um, my essay is called A Taste of Coconut. Uh, you, you, won't, uh, you, you don't know wh why until the end, but I'm going to read some, a couple of pages from the beginning. I've eaten some of the best meals of my life in Paris, but when I think of that city, the food that comes immediately to mind is a street vendor's chunks of fresh chilled coconut. It was my first visit to Paris. I was 21, just out of college and traveling with a boyfriend. We'd taken the train from Frankfurt, which was where my sister then lived with her new husband, who was in the U.S. Army and whom she'd married shortly, after, shortly before he was stationed in Germany. My mother was already visiting them when Stefan and I arrived, and for the next three weeks we tootled through parts of southern Germany, Austria, and northern Italy, the five of us packed into my brother-in-law's Volkswagen Beetle. I confess this was one of the hardest things I've ever done. 
We stopped for several days in my mother's hometown of Schwäbisch Gmünd, where her brother lived, and stayed with him in the same house where they'd both grown up, and where I'd visited only once before at the age of two. My sole memory of that first visit is of my grandmother locking me in a dark closet for calling her a witch. <laughs> Whatever she may have thought, it wasn't name-calling. That severe woman terrified me. A wealth of family stories would later confirm that I was not far off the mark, and I can't say I entirely regret it not having had a second chance to meet Oma, who'd died suddenly the year before. It was autumn. Without planning to, we hit Munich in the middle of Oktoberfest, where it seemed half the revelers were exuberantly sloshed Australians contending to drown out beer here, beer here with more piss, more piss. I've never been much of a beer drinker, but I relished the traditional snacks, in particular my first taste of the large white German beer radishes, carved concertina style and heavily salted as I would relish my first ever gelato made with real pistachio nuts and nothing like the artificially flavored psychedelic green ice cream back home, which was waiting for me in Bolzano. So addictive was the flavor that much later living in Rome, I would eat pistachio gelato almost every day for a year. After we all returned to Frankfurt, Stefan and I continued on our way home. Boarding the train for Paris, we neglected to bring any food. The train had no cafe car. We'd had nothing but coffee for breakfast. And as the hours passed, we grew increasingly dismal. We kept lighting up in the vain hope that nicotine would take the edge off our hunger. To make matters more torturous, we were joined in our compartment by another American couple who unpacked a picnic. You didn't bring any food? Everyone knows you always bring food on European trains, the woman informed us. And I can still see the brown bread with its gleaming smear of butter topped by discs of pink sausage in her hand. I can smell the bittersweet chocolate bars that they broke out for dessert and ate with such infuriating slowness. They had been smart enough to bring lots of food, none of which, however, they showed any inclination to share, no matter how shamelessly I stared. Lunch over, the woman settled back and made herself more hateful by telling us what a miserable time lay in store for anyone foolish enough to visit Paris without speaking good French, which of course she did allow her to demonstrate, and we of course did not. And so we arrived at the Gare de l'Est, famished and cranky and tense with anxiety. In those days, it was not uncommon for American tourists to travel through Europe, even to major cities, without bothering to book accommodations. You simply headed for whatever quarter of Paris you wished to stay in, equipped with a list of hotel names and the phrase, Avez-vous une chambre pour la nuit? This had worked flawlessly for any number of people we knew. And we, took the met and we took the metro to Saint-Germain-des-Prés, fully expecting it would work for us too. Having lived on a commune some time earlier, Stefan and I had had our fill of hippies and group lodging and were determined on this trip to avoid youth hostels. Almost immediately, we encountered two middle-aged couples from Chicago who'd arrived an hour or so ahead of us and who'd been running hither and thither in search of rooms. They were having a tough time, one of the men said, because the girls would not do without private baths. Though we ourselves had no such requirement, in fact, we thought it absurd, our luck was no better. There were no vacancies at the hotels we tried. We stood helplessly with our bags in the Rue Bonaparte, feeling more like refugees than like a young couple on vacation. It was near sunset now and growing chilly, and I began to despair. The possibility of spending our first night in Paris without a roof over our heads seemed dismayingly real. Even though I was the one who knew at least a little high school French and Stefan knew none at all, we agreed that he should continue the search alone while I waited with the bags. I sank down onto one of the suitcases, feeling woefully conspicuous and worried that I might start sniffling. The past few weeks had had their share of trying moments. To begin with, hypersensitive to jet lag, I had not had a good night's sleep since leaving New York. 
Also, this happened to be a period when members of my family rarely saw eye to eye or reason to be quiet about it, and every little disagreement had managed to blaze into a quarrel. And then, like most inexperienced tourists, we'd exhausted ourselves trying to do too much in the short time we had. Yet even my misery couldn't blind me to the enchantments surrounding me. There is what filmmakers call the magic hour, and then there's the magic hour in Paris. And here came a quaint sight, a street sweeper, not a machine, but a man using a handmade broom. As he passed, he acknowledged me with a throaty mademoiselle and touched his cap smartly. I may have found something, Stefan said carefully. I'm not sure what you'll think. But just to prepare you, it's kind of a hole. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next is Andre Asimon, a memoirist, essayist, novelist, and distinguished professor of comparative literature at the CUNY Graduate Center, whose memoir, Out of Egypt, won the Whiting Writers Award. And his most recent novel is Harvard Square. This is The Last Supper in Tuscany. Um, my wife, my three kids, we would go to Tuscany for a series of years and we would spend about a week in a house in agroturismo, which I've grown to hate. And um, and that basically, and this last time made me hate it all the more. But it had its enchanting moments. Um, basically, we, we always went with another family. This time we went with two other families. Um, we, one of the, the parents was a man who had only one mission. He was looking for Brunello wines. And he kept talking about Brunello wines. And I couldn't care less about Brunello wines, but he certainly did. And he taught his kids to know about Brunello wines. My kids couldn't stand it. And anyway, the, we arrived in the house, and of course they were still cleaning it, so we kind of waited. Then we said, you know, we have all this laundry which we need to make, to, to wash. And they said, well, we'll wash it for you. I said, no, we can do it ourselves. No, 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 we'll do it, but we'll charge you. So I said, no. Um, and the next thing, and then of course I said, where is the internet? Because they had advertised it was going to be internet and Wi-Fi. And they said, oh, no, no, there is no Wi-Fi here. Uh, you're here to relax. Every time we complain about something, she would say we had to relax. Anyway, the thing kept getting worse and worse. We had an accident because their, their road was terrible. And eventually, two things put the finishing blow. Early on Monday morning, we awoke not only with mosquito bites all over our bodies, despite the citronella, but to the loud snarls of a tractor chortling away at precisely 8 a.m. When we left to visit one of the wine villages nearby, Brunello, the tractor was still <laughs> chuffing away and giving vigorous belches. When I finally mustered the courage to knock at the landlady's door to complain that, that um, we had been woken up by the tractor, she said there was nothing she could do. This is a farm, you know. Not everyone is a tourist here, she said. But couldn't they start an hour later, I asked? They have to eat, poor people, don't they? Olives, wine, and pigs, they don't just happen, you know. So, I mean, this was getting very, very unpleasant. Um, towards the end, I became unpleasant too, and so did the friends, but I think everybody was unpleasant. Um, then the final day, the next morning we greeted her warmly, but with distance, and wearing a butcher's leather apron, the old lady, she was a landlady, she owned the property, looked hunched and humbled and sad. Suddenly I felt as though we had offended her, and she was repaying our makeshift, makeshift gratitude with genuine kindness and understanding. Tonight I have a surprise for you. What surprise, I asked, fearing the worst. You will see. And off she shoveled on her grieving bunions. Later in the afternoon, on our last day, our, on parking our car after visiting Assisi, we spotted two handymen at our doorstep carrying two large wrapped packages. The signora wanted to give you this. They are the best cuts. She hopes you had a pleasant stay. I unfolded the mysterious paper wrapping and saw meat. What is it? I gestured. It's the maiale, he explained. The pig. Which pig? The signora had it butchered this morning for your dinner tonight. 
When I looked again, I saw that there was enough meat for a battalion. After a hasty swim, everyone got busy. My boys washed the salad. The twin girls of the Brunello family uh, put aside their cell phones and sliced the tomatoes. Someone started boiling the large vat of water for our usual pasta, while the adults worked the grill outside. We picked oregano from the garden and the rosemary from one of the many bushes outside the doorstep and sprinkled it on the meat. Once the steaks were set on the grill, a wonderful aroma began to permeate the air. Someone said that the meat should be juicy, not dry. Genius girl, daughter of the Brunello man, okay, set the table for 12. One of my boys lit the citronella on the table, and then the father who had bought a case of Brunello had a brainstorm and decided that life was only lived once and that at least one of his precious Brunellos needed to be opened tonight. No one objected, and right away we began comparing his Brunello to the Signora's artisanal wine. There was no comparison. The Brunello was sublime. But the homemade wine wasn't bad either. And then, one by one, we sat at the table, feeling that this indeed was a feast, and that if we had to do it all over again, there was no doubt that we would. Including the gash in the car, including the gash in the car, including the mosquitoes and the tractor and the poor bat that fluttered like crazy in the middle of the night, including the bats and the insects, including the signora, most certainly the signora. We were learning to do something we should have done from the very first minute we'd arrived, enjoy ourselves, enjoy one another, and in the words of the old signora, learn to relax. <laughs> How very nice. These, I, I'm, alas, must report that our, our next reader is our last reader. This could go on and on, as far as I'm concerned. I just love, I love hearing these stories so very much. Um, Francine Prose, another very dear friend of mine, is the author of more than 20 books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Glorious Ones, Blue Angel, which was a National Book Award finalist, and Household Saints. She has won a James Beard Award, served as president of the Pen, Amer of Pen, Pen America. Pan American Center, and is the distingu distinguished visiting writer and professor of literature at Bard College. Francine. Thanks, Jim. Well, oddly enough, this is the second piece of the night to uh, consider the question, should I have the cassoulet or the steak? Uh, and. Um, the piece is called, We'll Have the Cassoulet. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of pages from the middle, so I'll just set it up. It's the early to mid-90s, uh, Christmas time, the south of France. I've gone there with my husband and our two sons, who were boys at the time, and my mother. And someone told us about this uh, tiny little town that had this beautiful nativity pageant in the local high school. And there was an amazing restaurant across the street from the high school, undiscovered, unspoiled, French country restaurant, local families. So we went in, it was just as described. Um, the adults were completely sold instantly, the kids were dubious. And um, we ordered, and then we waited, and we waited, and we waited. I'm not sure I would have been so attuned to the signs of kitchen meltdown if I hadn't been around for a few in the past. Scenes were part of the drama at the cooking school near our house where you could eat delicious French food and watch behind a window chefs reducing culinary students to tears. The first wood-fired pizza place in our town in upstate New York was opened by two brothers and the wife of one. On the first night they were in business, one brother hit the other over the head with a skillet and sent him to the emergency room. After that it was just the one guy and his wife. They had a mural painted of themselves looking out on a Tuscan landscape. Until one night we went there and noticed that the husband had been painted out of the mural. <laughs> in any case, I felt something familiar in the air of the restaurant in Provence. A sort of sonic rumble, the calm before the you-know-what. Maybe I was imagining it. I decided to think that I was. We ordered soups and salads, then the veal stew, the roast duck, the goose, two orders of steak frites. 
The waitress wrote down what we wanted, and with a hasty glance at the kitchen, vanished through the swinging door. Ten minutes passed, then twenty. The waitress brought more olives. So far, okay, it was fine. This is what you expected if you ate at a place that hadn't yet discovered what a microwave could do to food. Another five minutes, maybe more. One by one, the French families left. Were they looking at us that way because they knew something we didn't? Or was it just that we were strangers and they were curious why we were there? They all knew how long we'd been waiting. We asked, what's going on? They shrugged and smiled. We were strangers. If they knew anything, they didn't have to tell us. The last French family had been gone for a few more minutes when we heard a man shouting really loud from the kitchen phrases that were way beyond my college French. There was some thudding of things clanging against walls and breaking. Now the woman was yelling too. No one seemed to have been hurt. We looked at each other. Now what? The owner slammed through the doors so hard and fast he seemed to levitate slightly off the ground. He passed us without seeing us. He didn't care how long we'd waited. We were not his problem. The front door banged shut behind him. Facing the window, I watched him get into his car and drive off. Probably we should have left. I don't know why we stayed. To see what would happen next, I guess. And also, we'd ordered lunch. I didn't remember seeing any other places to eat nearby. It was Sunday afternoon. It was starting to snow. The nativity play was supposed to start in just over an hour, and we were hungry. A nervous young man I hadn't seen before opened the kitchen door and looked out. He saw us and seemed even more nervous than he'd been before. After a while, the waitress reappeared. Her eye makeup was blurry, but otherwise, she was okay. Obviously, she knew we'd heard and seen her husband leave, so it was an awkward moment. She said she was sorry they didn't have anything we'd ordered. Not the duck, not the veal, not the steak frites. Rien de tout. My mother said, so okay, what do you have? It struck me as the kind of question that under the circumstances only a sweet little old lady could get away with asking. The waitress looked startled. Cassoulet, she said. What's cassoulet? asked our sons. Franks and beans, we said. You'll like it. <laughs> they asked how I knew they'd like it, and I said, I knew. Fine, I told the waitress, we'll have the cassoulet. Ten minutes, she said. We've got an hour until the play, I said. Who cares about that, said my mother. Was it really a great cassoulet? The greatest cassoulet ever? I remember that it was. I remember thinking that it made sense the dish she had, that it was the dish she had on hand and could give us was one of those foods that got better a day or a few days later. Every bean was a masterpiece. The chunks of sausage were sublime. I thought I'd known something about duck confit, but until now, I'd known nothing. I'd been a cassoulet virgin. Our dishes were topped with breadcrumb, a breadcrumb crust that crumbled into the sauce from the beans. Let me be clear about one thing. I would rather have spared the wife the unpleasantness of what had just happened. I would have skipped our fabulous cassoulet if the Sunday afternoon hadn't exploded. But we weren't the cause of it. We were just the witnesses. And in a way, I guess, it's beneficiaries. We ate what was in the kitchen and paid our bill and left. Did the couple reconcile? Did they split up forever? Did he drive away and never come back? Or did this happen every Sunday? <laughs> Which possibility would have been worse? I have no explanation or any way of knowing. All I have is a partial memory of the human drama of that afternoon, alongside a much more pleasant and ever so slightly guilty memory of the food. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think we have a few minutes for uh, some questions um, for, for all of our wonderful readers tonight. And thank you, you guys, all of you, very, very lovely. Um, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to come on up? Um, and I guess you've got a Yeah, a I have a microphone if anyone out there has questions, so we can hear you guys, too. Um, I can... We've got Josh Ozersky, Beth Cracklauer, Andre Asaman, Sigrid Nunez, Monique Trong, and Francine Prose. I'm not, uh, blocking Monique. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question in the back? Yes. <laughs> uh, Kingston. Kingston. 
Why? What was well, the you know what was pizzeria? You know the. Yeah, no, no, it's not the fancy one in Rhinebeck. It's the, it's the, uh, the one with the mural in Kingston. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm the pain in the ass. I'm going to bring up off to topic. Joel, are you the gentleman who was just shunned in South, it's at South Beach Food and Wine? No, Joel is some other guy. I'm Josh. Okay. I, I was, I was. I'm I sorry. <laughs> you get, you get, I, I'll, I'll take the blame if I got your name wrong. Listen, I mean, I'm happy you got it that close. The fact of the matter is that I was, I believe, blackballed from the hamburger contest by Ann Burrell. But uh, it may not be true. Why? What do you mean? <laughs> well, she hates me with a white hot loathing. Well, she shouldn't. Well, she hasn't done anything to prove herself yet. So I, I went around tell I went around town calling her Man Burrell for a couple of years. <laughs> There's worse you can call. It. I've, I've heard worse in South Beach. I promise you. And I've been behind the tables there. So that's why I want to hear the story. Well, that's 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 about it. I mean, that's all I have to say. Which burger did you it was um, a little tiny, inconspicuous, and nondescript slider that I thought had inner beauty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some guy from Orlando. Any, I think we've got another one over Orlando. here. <laughs> this is for anyone, but I'd love to know how um, you selected the story for, for this book, the story that you used. Well, I can st I can start off. I mean, because um, you know, uh, I don't know if you were here at the very beginning. Actually, I think you were. I had you know we I come up with this sort of basic construct, uh, um, um, an important food memory, something something that was significant to who you are, not just any old food memory, but something something more powerful, more resonant than that, and. Um, reached out to you know this wonderful group of I guess it's a, it's roughly 24 contributors that are in the book um, and luckily basically like the 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 first people that I reached out to they were they were like they were down for it they signed up I wanted to however avoid a traffic jam a topic traffic jam I was nervous that oh my gosh what if everybody writes about Paris what if everybody writes about you know Thailand or if three or four people want to write write about Thailand so I asked folks to come up with three or four ideas that they think would would work for the book and 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 then out of that we 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 chose our favorites, but um. I actually have something to say about this because it speaks to what a special book it is. I I've wanted to write this story for a long time, and we talked about me doing yep. it. Sever. Yep. I mean, it never felt quite right as a magazine story. It, was, it would have involved bringing a photographer down to this very personal event and reporting it in a in a way that in, in a voice that I don't know just didn't feel right for the story. But as soon as he told me about what this book would be like and the kinds of other pieces that would be in it, I knew that this was the perfect form to do it in. How about you, Sigrid? I got my invitation and instructions from you and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a couple of things about just, 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 just the, the idea of the case. Mm -hmm. Why this one idea, though, and not any of another thousand ideas? I that think partly because I, I because Again, like I, it, I said, that the, the, the memory most attached to uh, Paris for me was this taste of coconut from a street vendor that's, you know, one franc, 25 cents a piece, even though I did end up, have since then, you know, eaten in all kinds of interesting places and good restaurants. And it was just the idea of how, um, how odd memory is. So that would be, when I think about Paris and the food of Paris, I think of this little piece of coconut, and that just seemed to be such, a, such a, a, an odd way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Andre? Well, I, th I think I was very honest with you when you called me and we spoke. I said, I'm not interested in food. <laughs> 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 and I'm not a foodie, I mean, but uh, you said, you know, how about an occasion where food was served and something happened to you? And actually, I got to like everybody that was sitting at the dinner table, including the man who insisted on food never. How about you, Money? Well, you know, I, it's actually a, a real tribute to you and to my previous experience with Sabor um, that I, I knew that I would probably have the space to sort of pitch a 
an idea that might seem a little bit outside of what people would expect from me, which is usually, you know, when I have the opportunity to write for a food magazine, they often will want something about Vietnam, because about Vietnamese, or about France, because uh, my first book was set in Paris. And here, you know, <laughs> I wanted to write about Greece, you know, a, a trip to an island, because it was just, you know, um, something that was, for me, symbolic of, of traveling without a map, you know, traveling into the unknown and seeing what will happen. And, and when I say it's a tribute to <laughs> James and, and to Beth, the piece that I wrote for Sabor a while ago was, <laughs> was, I know, something that they totally did not expect when they contacted me. They contacted me for a wonderful um, sort of series of essays about your most memorable meal. And people were writing about these, you know, just elaborate, delicious, wonderful things. And what I pitched and what they accepted was the horrifying sort of introduction that I had as a child to Jell-O salad. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, I mean, there was a lot more to that story than just the horror. <laughs> but, you know, I figured, you know, folks who uh, would be open and welcoming of that idea would allow me to write my work. Francine, why, why this story? Well, uh, it was a story that I, I'd kind of been dining out on, so to speak, uh, before <laughs> I wrote it. And, and also the little detail that's left out of the story is that the reason we were in Provence was to do a, I was doing a travel piece for a kind of conventional Christmas in Provence travel piece. And I couldn't put this story in the piece because it's not the kind of story you can put in a certain kind of conventional. And it, it sort of made me cranky that I couldn't include it in the mm. piece. So, so I've saved it up all these years and I was very glad to have something to do with it. And Josh, why, why this story about your dad, this trip to, um, to Paris? Well, I had originally I, I had thought, I assumed as, as you suggested that everybody was going to write about Paris and Certainly anybody who wrote about Paris would write about it more knowledgeably and thoughtfully than I would. And I actually thought of doing it, the, my first idea was I was going to do New York, like going and being like a sort of like, you know, feral Bulgarian from Atlantic <laughs> City and like going to New York mm -hmm. for the first time, you know, <laughs> for the first few times. But uh, I had just written this, uh, this piece for Savor um, a, that was a very deeply personal uh, piece about my father, the first such I ever did. And it just, you know, the, 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 the liquid overflowed uh, that glass and into this one. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Any other questions? I there are a couple right here. actually running out of time, but oh. we've got time for one more. Oh, okay. Where were those hands? <laughs> okay. You're the closest. <laughs> um, uh, just if everyone could, very briefly, in a word, top of your head, say the oddest and you were starting with it, oddest or grossest thing you ever ate? That it was memorable. The jello, perhaps. <laughs> Just the, the most memorable, singular thing wow. that you ever consumed. And by, by gross, or you mean turn off? Or uh. I ate some weird fish, unidentifiable fish things in the market once, and I still don't know what they were. And it just, what I all remember about that market. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I definitely have a taste in mind. The first time I ever ate, um, first I came to the U.S. when I was six years old from Vietnam, and the first time I ever ate um, mayonnaise in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still don't touch it. <laughs> I I ate um, sea urchin before I was old enough to eat it. Yeah. Had that was yummy. Yum. Yeah. It's terrific, right? <laughs> but it wasn't. Not, not, not so cute. <laughs> well, I was going to say exactly the same thing. But sea urchin? Sea urchin <laughs> at the beach, and somebody cracked it over, <laughs> and then just let me say, oh, this is delicious. I said, well, let me try it. <laughs> 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 um, mine actually relates to this story. My problem, which I couldn't get into in here, because it's another story, is that chicken livers as a child was that when we would go to my other grandparents in Missouri and fish for catfish, we baited the hooks 
with chicken livers. You know, as a kid, you have very strong rules about things. I'm sort of like, this fish food. I can't blend fish food. So I got over it eventually, but as a small kid, I just couldn't separate it. Uh, this is an easy one. I, the worst thing I ever ate by far was an ortolan. It was a, a semi-legendary uh, French, illegal French songbird that's eaten whole. And I was invited by a very, very famous French chef and a very, very famous TV personality to like have this incredible one-time you know, experience. And it was so disgusting. It was the <laughs> most disgusting thing I've ever eaten by far. And I've eaten many foul things. Did you put the napkin, napkin over your head? Did you I wanted to put a noose over my head. <laughs> <laughs> An executioner. Uh, last month, I was in a little town in Oklahoma, halfway between <laughs> You know this story. I between can't. Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And it was freezing cold. There was no place in town was open. We were in despair. We found this uh, student taco joint, and we thought, gee, you know, uh, Cheese enchiladas, how wrong can you go? Well, the cheese enchiladas came with two inches of industrial mayonnaise on the top, and um, I, I cried. Oh. <laughs> I cried. She, she, she could. I love mayonnaise, actually. Francine refused to remember the name of the town and insisted on calling it Shit Rock. <laughs> it was shit. Sort of em embellished the thing. Mine, um, it's a restaurant that will remain nameless. Foie gras donuts. Oh. <laughs> So, I mean, I have a kind of allergy to like crazy, chefy, desperate for attention food anyway, and this just seemed to be sort of the pinnacle of all of that. Just like, oh, stop it! Sort of like Susan Powder used to say back in the '80s, "Stop the insanity." That was so. That was it. What a funny way to be ending this, like otherwise potentially very delicious <laughs> evening. But we're all going to be thinking of very delicious foods now instead. But but thank you guys for coming. It was great to see you.